motion for that. That's no, just that's just FYI. I provided you yep. with the information. You've yep. approved that field trip. Yep. However, this field trip, you asked for additional information, and I yep. also included in your packet because Mr. Burns is not with us this evening. He's with students in Europe and with Ms. Camuso. Uh, he brought forward this close-up program, and so I included his response to some of the questions that school committee members had about the close-up program, and I will do my best, or uh, Mr. Beck, if you have additional questions, to answer those with what we know. Um, but what we uh, what we asked last last month was mm -hmm. Mr. Burns here was because this is a new trip and a, and a kind of an expensive one, although very cool sounding. That we asked Mr. Burns to go and assess student interest before we approved the um, field trip. And I believe does it say that 20, yeah, 27 students have expressed interest in attending the program. Mm -hmm. This is the program that's going to. D C, C. correct, and it's close up to whom I don't remember. <laughs> there's a um, there's a pretty standard program that often um, there are high school and middle school programs. Uh, they're very well designed. They've gone on for several decades, and because of that, they have um, a great deal of access uh, because they have a the history of having a great deal of credibility. Um, so. If they really primarily, I believe, get access to the Hill, you know, to, to Capitol Hill, having the opportunity to potentially meet with somebody local as well. Um, an experience, you know, not a, a, an abbreviated version of, of perhaps what uh, your young senior had, got, had the opportunity to, to do. So, uh, and, and certainly um, those are the kind of visits that lead to things like internships and, and uh, kids you know, taking on something different in college, um, leading to, you know, kids getting interested in the law and, and uh, you know, pursuing that. In poli sci and economics, sure. for instance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Civic process in general. Yes. I, I, I don't mean to put you on the spot, Mr. Beck, but since we're, we're seeing these pricey field trips, a student whose family can't afford it, they can contact you directly and ask about funds or is it, yeah, we I just don't. I don't want to have a two-tier education system where we have a bunch of kids things whose parents can afford things, and then we have other people who can't. So no, we we have um, limited access to some additional funds, and typically, uh, it's gone to students in in particular on the seventh and eighth grade trips. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it is rare, although there have been a handful of students who, at the high school level, for some of these trips, have asked um, mm -hmm. for some money, and will need to do some fundraising. Uh, for the principal's account to, you know, keep that up um, okay. so that we have the opportunity to find a way to make sure that anybody who wants to go hopefully does. Okay. <clears throat> and I think that, that the change in fundraising may also make a difference for students as well. Right. So. Yeah, he did, he did suggest that he was going to <coughs> seek yes. some funding mm -hmm. from yes. some of our local civic groups and, yes. and things like that. So. Okay. If I could say, Roby, I think that, that, that that's a really excellent point in that for my own part, I'm willing and now interested in reaching out to districts that, especially given the, the demographic changes that I just shared with the school mm -hmm. committee, and by no means <coughs> this community be considered in any way a high poverty community, right. but certainly how do other communities, how do other communities encourage people to ask for help? Because even if somebody somebody what probably happens is people simply opt out exactly right exactly they opt out right and so how do we prevent that from happening and are there ideas and ways of ensuring that field trips are an opportunity because they're a terrific opportunity right. yeah. without resulting in having this two-tiered system where someone might just quietly opt out rather than having to ask yeah. i will look into that and i'll bring back what I find in the school committee. And you do have a fund, a principal's fund, that's discretionary for this type of situation. Mm -hmm. It's a benefactor. It does. It does. Two or three or yeah. right. there are <laughs> there are some um, There are some local businesses, Big Y, mm -hmm. uh, Target, and, and oh, other yeah. funds that feed in sure. uh, a reasonable amount each year into mm -hmm. that. So it is nice to have the local support and that's directly attached to folks shopping at those places and picking up cards and so forth. So it's, it's nice that people think about adding their school on to those accounts when they're given the opportunity to because even though it's automated, the stores do give money back to the school and that's exactly what it goes to. 
So, do members have enough information to um, take a vote on this trip? Yes. We are required to approve field trips. That okay. are out of state and overnight, and right. or overnight. Mm -hmm. Motion to approve this field trip. Thank you. Would you like to second? Second. <laughs> okay, any comments? I All just appreciate the extra information. Yes, that was nice. Thanks to Mr. Burns on that. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Where are we in? School choice in the report. Oh, thank you. So this is also something that will require a vote of the school committee. What you see in your report is that we, I have met with the administrators. They have spoken with their staff. And I also uh, met with the HES teachers with Mr. Udall. And after that, but I certainly were interested in school committee input. At this point, we said that we would be recommending that Hadley participate in school choice in 2015 and 16 for all grades except grade two. So that would be all of the grades except grade two. What the chart shows you is the current March 1st, 2015 enrollment. So you would then bump all of those students up a grade. <clears throat> Jeff and I had a wonderful conversation with this faculty at the elementary school and one of his teachers, Carol Pinio, came up with an excellent idea because Jeff and I were trying to wrap our head around, well, how do our class sizes stack up compared to other places and we certainly appreciate when school choice provides revenue. His faculty, again, did an exceptional job of talking about their concerns that they never want to be in a position to have to cut programs. In this district, we talk about art and music not as specials but as essentials mm -hmm. and so we don't want to find ourselves in a position where those are ever cut. However, we also want to make sure that every child is getting the attention that he or she needs and individualized attention. Ms. Pinio talked about a district that used <clears throat> kind of a weighted enrollment so it wasn't just we don't want our class sizes and, and the elementary school we talked about not having class sizes in one through six that exceeded 25 but then teachers said, well, you know, sometimes it depends on the class. And so there uh, is a district that is, has looked at the kinds of services a student needs, and they don't have to be special education services. It could be Title I. They could be just additional academic support in the classroom. And that's how you create kind of a weight of enrollment, is that you would assign a value to that. And it's not strictly scientific. We never, I mean, there's room for teacher subjectivity. Teachers know children and say, really, in order for everybody to get the attention that, that he or she needs, that they all need, we should not exceed this, this number. But I, I think there's going to be discussion among the committee about um, does this make sense? Should it be all classes participating, or are there other thoughts on that? Well, in years past, I, the school committee has asked that not that kindergarten and first grade Mm -hmm. that we try to keep those classes to the extent possible less <coughs> 20 or less and that the rest of the grades 25 or less okay. is my memory. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, to, I mean, I've been a parent sitting out there over the same mm -hmm. issue. Okay. And we've had it come up on, since I've been in school committee also. I think when there's, I, I think parents have an easier time accepting if it's a natural increase within the town, but if class sizes feel big to them and it's because of school choice, they tend not to like it very mm -hmm. much, particularly in the younger grades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Jeff, I may need to put you on the spot here. Of course, you don't, I have, they are looking at the enrollment numbers, which um, you may or may not have right in front of you for um, 2015. So when we say, which is great, keeping K and 1, which K, um, this keeping K and 1, we already thought K would be at 20 or less because we strive to have a 10 to 1 student to adult ratio in our kindergarten classrooms, and we do have a classroom assistant in each classroom. When you're looking at this grid, you see the current kindergarten class is at 30. Yep. Um, and so if uh, there were to be 20 students in each class, we would, we would essentially have room for 10 additional yep. seats in that grade. Mm -hmm. But Jeff, what do you have any way of having any sense around how much <clears throat> move-in? This is really an unfair question. I mean, or maybe you all, a, a sense of move-in around younger grades. I mean, should we should we refrain? Is that what you're saying from opening up K and 1 at this point and save those spots for um, 
families that may move in. I'm not asking well, yeah, this question. I, well. I don't know how firm your kindergarten numbers. Have you had kindergarten registration? We did. Okay. I'll, I'll be happy to report on that now if you'd like. It's on the agenda for later. Um, we have 29 currently registered. Okay. Town okay. census indicated that we would be at about 34, 35. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we had some come in that we didn't know about, yeah. Yeah. some that we know about or that are on the census we haven't heard any information back. Mm -hmm. And then we also have the school choice uh, numbers that would be factored in. So we're looking at probably anticipated enrollment of, a, of the, at least the mid-30s. Um, mm -hmm. It could be a little higher depending on what we get for school choice. And I believe Corey Feltovic said that we've had, and this information I think is coming from central office, um, another four or five, maybe even six inquiries about it that are school choice. So with all of those factored in, we could be at high 30s or right around 40, and we would still be at two classrooms mm -hmm. in the kindergarten next year. So um, again, it's uh, town census numbers we've found are not always right. that right. reliable. Right. So, and we usually get some that will roll in at the beginning the of it. You know, yep. <laughs> at the beginning of the year, at the very end of the summer that we had yep. not anticipated. Exactly. Um, the current um, first grade is at 30. Um, certainly opting to increase that number, we can accommodate. It is a class that does not have a lot of um, particular needs. Um, and so I think we could definitely elevate that. The current first grade is a very difficult class. Um, and that's why you heard Dr. McKenzie indicate that we would not be recommending uh, and our, our current enrollment in that grade is 22 and 21, which is higher than what we'd like to see, but it is, you know, it is a manageable number. And then going up in the other grade numbers, um, our, from third to the current sixth, our class sizes are ranging anywhere from about 16 in the current sixth grade now, where we have three classrooms, right. up to 23 in one of our fourth grade classrooms. Mm -hmm. So our numbers are pretty close to 20, if not right. a little bit over in most of those. Now, if you're looking at 25 per grade level, we could accommodate a higher number. Um, and that's a discussion that Dr. McKenzie and I, and, and as administrators, have, we've had um, lengthy discussions about it. Um, I do find that um, you know Carol Pinio's um, insight was really something that the staff understood and, and liked, mm -hmm. um, and it does make a lot of sense um, because it is difficult to with with basically two classrooms per grade level in, at the elementary school, with the exception of next year's fourth grade, which is the only grade level we'll have three sections. That it's you know, not, not an easy task of determining assignments and trying to make that whole process as, as equitable as, as possible. There is a formula that we use and um, it is a very time consuming process. It starts this week and it won't be finalized until probably the first week in June. So there are 16 and 3 classes in fourth grade next year, is that what you said? Uh, no, no. Um, right now we are looking at um, 17 to 18. Mm -hmm. Our numbers are at 56 right now okay. in the f current third grade, fourth grade next year. Right. Our current numbers right now are 46 in the um, in the current sixth grade. So we're at 15 in one class and 16 at the other two. What's the grade that has um, three classes? Going into next year will be fourth grade. And that has how many children in it? And there's 56 in there. So okay, we could yeah, accommodate that's actually usually where you a few there get pressure too. for three classrooms. You could bump it up to 60 at that point. So, no. so then you'd still be looking at a reasonable number of 20. That is also a very challenging grade level as well. Mm -hmm. And I think a weighted formula would make a lot of sense for that particular grade as well, as would next year's sixth grade. Mm -hmm. so. And just for clarification for school committee members, if you're looking at the grid and thinking, Wait a minute, Jeff is saying different, Mr. Udall is saying different right. numbers. This is a March 1st, 2015 enrollment, so believe it or not, there's enrollment changes since March 1st, 2015 in reporting. Mm -hmm. So thoughts from the committee, school choice participation in the grades, you don't have to decide the number of seats. That's something right. we right. simply advertise that Hadley, the school committee decides if the, if the school district participates in school choice and which grades we would participate. So that's the school committee's purview to make that decision. And I don't know, if Brian, also we haven't been talking about Hopkins, but 
Hopkins is, is open for business, and Brian, you might want to say a few <laughs> words about that. Come one, come all. Uh, yeah, I mean, we'd love we to have, have you. Please. We have uh, school choice seats in every grade level, and it's been it's it's actually been great. Um, we have a pretty significant number of folks who have come and, and done vertical shadow days uh, in many cases where sixth graders have the opportunity to go through a, a day that we kind of configure based on what they're interested in. Mm -hmm. Um, and our, our student ambassadors, our student shadows, have been just exceptional at having, providing the opportunity for kids to just be in class with them, help them to feel comfortable, and kids have had great experiences over the last couple of years uh, in going through that process. So um, we have space open at each grade level depending on um, the total number of students in each grade. For example, you know, we have two really clear entry points for high school for families who are making school choice decision in seventh grade and ninth grade. <coughs> This year's eighth grade will, is a, a large graduating class with 54 students in it. Um, so for us, that'll be the area where we'll probably have the lowest number <clears throat> outside of the senior class, which has 55 students in it. Um, and uh, that number will, will be relatively read around there. The last couple of years, a trend has been that we have had a handful of seniors move in or transfer um, back from private schools within the district. So similar to Mr. Udall's idea of a weighted formula, those are the only two places where we have um, some considerations for limiting numbers. But you know, we have two grades that are very small, in uh, one grade with 36 students, and the current seventh grade has uh, 45 students, so there are plenty of school choice seats available there. Um, next year's sixth grade is 48, is that correct? Uh, March 1st, 2015, it was 48. Yes, okay. 48. 48. So we have approximately 12 spots open in the seventh grade, which is a great entry point for students. So, so to be clear, the proposal in front of the school committee is to accept school choice, but to do it in this weighted fashion? The proposal for the school committee is to which grades. So I had recommended that we would... I had recommended that all grades except <coughs> grade two, but there's been this discussion and certainly I want to be respectful that history and what expectations people have in town, the school committee would, somebody from the committee would make a motion to participate and at what grade levels. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's up to the committee. I've been, I've been spending a little bit of time at the high school. Um, will come up a little bit later and um, this is my son is at the middle school for the first time this year and it's amazing to me just how many more students there are at the elementary school and how much more frenetic things are I have a child in the second grade I hear a lot about what's going on in the second grade I would say um, at the I, I, I really commend the teachers at the elementary school and I I like the idea of a weighted system mm -hmm. of analysis of the needs of the individual class. Um, and I, I like the idea of taking full and maximum use um, of school choice at the Hopkins side of things where yeah. there seem to be a lot of school students coming from afar and we're really shoring up our program here at the Hopkins level, but really trying to stabilize what's going, I mean, mm -hmm. at the elementary school there's there's a lot going on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so finding some way to protect the quality of education mm -hmm. um, in light of um, the demographic changes mm -hmm. and the needs mm -hmm. that we're, we're seeing. So, And I want to be clear too what I'm hearing from people. So we had talked about this number of 25 except for in kindergarten, but what I'm really hearing from the committee is that the community would like and expects at the lower grades, the class sizes are much closer to 20. Mm -hmm. Is that K and one? Yes. yes. K and one. I think any time, it, it's a little tricky when you say 25 in each grade because that should work out. But certainly when class grades start to be more than 50 in the elementary school, you often get <coughs> parents who would like to see three classrooms. And certainly we have had many times when it's October, it's November, and we have parents here mm -hmm. begging for a third classroom. Um, theoretically, the weighted Mm -hmm. Ideas should take care of that, but mm -hmm. it's you know it's a, it's risky, right? So, Robert, you so. said you have parents here when you approach that twenty-five per class in two <coughs> classes. I think in the younger grades, um, as a kindergarten and first grade, um, twenty-five feels like a lot to a lot of parents. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, Jeff said it feels like it a lot to me. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah and and I I think historically the school mm -hmm. committee has time and again mm -hmm. sort of 
pushed back yep. on, on those kind of numbers. Uh, another thing also, although this won't apply any longer, but um, <coughs> excuse me, one of the NIAC criteria was a 10 to 1 ratio. Right. And so in kindergarten, you know, that's right. 20. Right. Yeah. Where we have the two adults in each room. Mm -hmm. And that we were going to keep in place. Regardless. Right, definitely, regardless. On the but other hand, I think Hopkins really benefits from larger grades as the kids are going back through and have <coughs> come in and sort of mix things up. Right, right. It's hard sometimes to go to school with the same group of people since right. kindergarten. So it's good to have that fresh flow. And I think it's good socially. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and if you said the choice in front of us is to determine whether we uh, would support school choice, and if so, for what grades. Correct. Um, I like that idea of supporting school choice, but having that smart system where the teachers get the input, because I believe, obviously, different teams function differently. So the people on the ground that are closest to it have the insight. So in that sense, I would support it for any grade where, through this weighted process involving the mm -hmm. principals and the teachers, they decide. It I sounds like caps, you know, upper limit caps yeah, are... Yeah. And I think what's important for the public to know, that's exactly right, Paul, but what's important for the public to know, because we have had so many calls, is that we are saying we do not anticipate any school choice opening next year in grade two. Okay. So that public should understand right. that, so they're because parents are trying to make decisions, but that we could potentially <coughs> anticipate school choice openings in other grades. <coughs> the fewest slots would be available in K <coughs> one. Parents should understand that, and um, of course, the folks watching this, they can see it on YouTube. But people have been calling and wanting to know. And that's based on informed decisions by the mm -hmm. folks who teach yes. these classes. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes. Are we ready? Yes. Yes. Good. That someone want to make a motion? A motion to accept <laughs> school choice for the next academic year. Mm -hmm. um, and to, do I need to also motion? You have to take a second minutes? grade. Yeah. Unless, um, unless we want to the just, the, just do what Paul said, which is <coughs> your discretion. I am going to encourage the school committee to okay. have it at this point to be all grades, and I correct in this, Mr. Udall, all grades except, two. we would advertise all grades except grade two. Yes. Is okay. that correct? That's yeah. Correct. All right. So, that makes it easier so just a point of clarity, in the future, though, every year you're going to have to come and tell us every which year. grades. Every year you right. do this. Right. We have right. to do this every year anyways. Mm -hmm. You do, okay. Yes, yeah. every year you have to go. Yes. All right. So motion to accept school choice for the next academic year except for grade two. Correct. Seconded. Thank you. Anything else or all in favor? All in favor. Okay, Aye. thanks. Next thing in your packet, uh, in accordance with the Unit A contract, we have resurrected the Hadley Professional Development Committee. So you have a copy of the agenda in your packet this Professional Development Day passed. I really want to thank all of our teachers. The majority of those workshops, almost all of them, were taught by or facilitated by one of our staff members. So they did an exceptional job. We um, disseminated a survey and had administered a survey and had people give us feedback on the quality of the workshops. And as I put in your report, the average ratings for sessions ranged on a scale of uh, zero to five, 3.4 to five being the average for some sessions. And I am very grateful to the staff. That was also the day that we had Jake Foster from the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education come out and meet with all teachers in grades one through 12 uh, science teachers at Hopkins to talk about the next generation science standards and implementation. And we're very grateful for that because I know there are many districts who are clamoring for attention from the department. So I am very grateful that the Director of Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics came out to Hadley to work with our teachers on that day. I have met with the Hadley Mothers Club. I appreciate, I spent an hour and a half with them. It was a wonderful meeting. Just want to let the school committee know, I think I brought this up before, that several members of Hadley Mothers Club are interested in providing or offering something called RAD training. It's Rape Regression Defense Course at Hopkins Academy for female students and their mothers or female guardians. Officer Damian Shanley is certified as an instructor and I have been in contact with Chief Mason about perhaps offering the facility in the evening or on the weekend for those children who would be interested and for their, their female guardians or moms to participate with them. The personnel report is in your packet. There's nothing extraordinary to report. And uh, lastly, what I need for my report is the school committee needs to vote 
to adopt uh, the, the proposed superintendent evaluation tool. Heather did say at the last meeting that she was fine with it. We were waiting, uh, Humera, I think, for you to <laughs> make sure that you were okay with it. Um, and so the tool and the process of superintendent evaluation, I'll just review again. We have a new school committee member and for the public. So assuming that the school committee adopts the tool this evening, the goals that are embedded in the tool have already been, been approved by the school committee. The superintendent goals are approved annually or biannually. Each committee member would complete the evaluation tool independently. Each committee member gives a rating for progress on every goal, whether the goal is met or progress has been made, and a rating for performance on each of the standards. For any rating other than proficient, so for a rating, any exemplary needs improvement or unsatisfactory, there's an expectation that committee members would provide an explanation. And then each committee member submits his or her evaluation to the chair. So there's only one rating, so that committee has to act as one voice in coming to a conclusion about the superintendent's performance. The chair then compiles individual ratings into a single rating for each category. The one document is reviewed publicly at an open meeting where there's conversation. The entire school committee deliberates on the conclusions that the chair drew about the individual ratings and determines the overall formative rating. So the entire evaluation takes place publicly. The individual ratings take place <coughs> privately, but that's because they don't mean anything until they become one public rating. Um, and then to that end, individual committee members cannot discuss their independent evaluations with one another um, without potentially violating open meeting law. So that's really something that the individual committee member must do on his or her own. And then the independent evaluations are not a part of the public record. The final evaluation is conducted publicly and a part of the public record. And the adoption of the tool requires a vote by the school committee. And so what we hope to do tonight is adopt the tool, self-evaluate the each person's, each member's evaluation occurs hopefully sometime in May. Mm -hmm. I'm compiling mm -hmm. at, by our June meeting, mm -hmm. and then the public evaluation occurs in June, the end of the fiscal year, the end of your first year. Oh, wow. Yeah. How did that happen? I don't know. So, is everyone comfortable with the tool? Yes. Can you just help me understand that it's the difference between the formative rating and the formative? Is that what it is? Yes. Did so, that? yes. So, the formative rating, it's required under the regulations for all educators that we receive a formative rating. So, this is teachers, principals, everybody, a formative rating and a summative rating. And originally, when I put together goals at the suggestion of the school committee, they suggested that some of those goals extend over a two-year period, that they were a little overly ambitious for one year. May I say now that you were right? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for that. And so therefore, the end of year one becomes the formative, and the end of year two becomes the summative rating. Both of those ratings, though, become a part of um, the Educator Personnel Information Management System, that means that these ratings are uploaded to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education. Both the formative rating and the final rating get uploaded to the department. Thank you. Okay, if we're comfortable with the tool, we need another motion. Full of motions. Motion to approve this superintendent evaluation tool. Thank you. I'll second. Any other comment? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Um, and can I, how about this, could I ask that you guys bring the self of that, your, your evaluation of Annie to May's meeting or to send it to me electronically? And that would give me until June's meeting to pull it all together. It would also give me, if you forget, a week or so to remind you. By <coughs> May, by May, whatever our meeting is in May? Yes, which will be the fourth. Monday in May, probably? Uh, actually, I think we're looking at... Oh, because that's Memorial, that's Day. Memorial Day. Day. So, so I don't know when it. that will be. I'll get back to you on that in just a few moments when we oh. talk about May meeting. We don't have her uh, material. Isn't she submitting material I before thought. we do the evaluation? No? So I will also... <laughs> I might be getting confused between... You may, yes, and so <laughs> um, one of the things that individual committee members can do is that some, in some cases, evidence is embedded. You may know in right. some of the goals, right. and um, also I will meet indi individually with any 
committee member. I don't have a binder per okay. se full right. of, of okay. evidence, right. but I will certainly, what I would expect is that an individual committee member, so you can communicate with me prior to individually mm -hmm. and say, I have no idea of how I would necessarily rate you on this. I'm thinking this, but can what kinds of evidence right. can you provide that demonstrate your competency in this standard? Okay. Um, and in other cases, you may have either observed through school committee, through some of the information presented in the packets, 